Tonight on Philly Cam Voices, Joe Biden is declared the winner of the 2020 presidential election, defeating Donald Trump. How Philly and the suburbs played a key role in his victory. We have more fallout after the killing of George Floyd sparked unrest in Philadelphia last spring. A popular activist is now facing federal charges after the rioting. And how one local restaurant plans to keep the business running this winter during the pandemic. Good evening and thank you for tuning into Philly Cam Voices. I'm your host, Amanda Johnson. We begin with the unrest in Philadelphia following the killing of George Floyd. Businesses were looted and police vehicles were set on fire. Now popular activist Anthony Smith is facing federal charges stemming from the violence. Chantel Belafonte reports. Federal authorities have charged Anthony Smith, a prominent West Philadelphia activist, with two accounts of arson, aiding and embedding, an obstruction of vehicle by means of fire on May 30th. The incident occurred during unrest in the city following the killing of George Floyd. Smith is also a social studies teacher and one of the organizers for Philadelphia Coalition for Racial, Economic, and Legal Justice. Philly for Real Justice is in the middle of a civil rights lawsuit with the Philadelphia police in response to racial injustice. U.S. Attorney William M. McSwain held a press conference announcing the charges and reminded protesters that engaging in criminal behavior and acting out of violence will be met with severe consequences. But there were a lot of people that were surrounding these vehicles that were destroyed or torched. And anybody that we can identify that had a role in that, you know, that we can positively identify and the evidence points to, we will charge. And so these are ongoing investigations. It's possible there could be more defendants who are charged in, in either case. McSwain said Smith was not targeted by his office. Mr. Smith was not in any way targeted by my office. I knew nothing about Mr. Smith or his affiliations until the investigation was nearly complete and the proposed charges have been written up by dedicated and capable career federal prosecutors. We do not investigate people at the U.S. Attorney's Office. We investigate alleged criminal behavior. According to Paul Hetznecker, Smith's attorney, his client's charges stem from Smith throwing paper into an already burning vehicle. Uh, in, in, in my long experience, the way in which the government attempts to try to uh, rope in or, or connect individuals that have very little do with, to do with the underlying crime with the underlying crime itself and the principal, the principal mean, meaning the person who did the crime. So the principal uh, person charged who started the crime the case. And, and according to the government, as we stand right now, they don't even know who started the, the, the fire. What they are alleging is that someone threw a flare into the police vehicle and then others uh, provided combustible materials and they've accused Anthony of throwing paper into the vehicle. In Hetznecker's experience, a crime like Smith's should not skip state level and enter federal jurisdiction. Hetznecker has represented hundreds of activists and protesters over the course of his career. Until 2016, the federal government did not get involved with arresting protesters in Philadelphia. What they're doing is they're essentially saying, we're going to stick our long arm, our powerful federal arm, and grab these state cases. And they're doing so, they're adopting these cases, simply because they're, they're a part of a protest movement, a broad, historic social justice movement and quest for racial justice. They are selecting, in my opinion, based on a political decision, to charge those who have uh, have some connection or alleged to have some connection to the burning of a police vehicle. So to me, this is a, a very dangerous use of the government's power, the federal government's power to criminalize dissent and to criminalize 
what would typically be, or to federalize what would typically be a state court crime. Taib Smith, principal of Little Giant Creative, says that Smith's case landing in the federal jurisdiction fits in line with Elijah Muhammad and Martin Luther King Jr. Both Taib and Anthony were recently recognized in Philadelphia Magazine as one of Philadelphia's 76 most influential people. I'm not naive enough to not, you know, believe that it's plausible that even when somebody says, well, I don't know how they, this ended up on my desk, you, you are aware that there's a history of white state-sponsored oppression that has, you know, coordinated to take the civic rights away from people like Mr. Smith. Hetznecker believes the government is using this matter to send a message to the protest movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is an effort to use, to politicize, to use the criminal uh, arm of the Justice Department to go after protests and to send a message to the protest movement and the Black Lives Matter movement in this country, which is a very dangerous message to send. Judge Henry Perkins ordered Smith to be released to his home in West Philadelphia with electronic monitoring and a curfew, but that order was reversed by Judge Joyner, seeking to keep Smith detained. Hexnecker advises any activists that have questions to seek an attorney prior to attending a protest. I'm Chantal Belafonte, reporting for Philly Cam Voices. The pandemic has left millions unemployed and businesses struggling to stay afloat. Restaurants have been specially hit hard. Shivani Reddy spoke to one local restaurant and wanted to find out how they plan to keep the doors open this winter. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, restaurant businesses have been struggling to stay open. Recently, Philadelphia has allowed to expand their indoor seating capacity to 50%. Many restaurants have maintained to stay open by moving seating outdoors to reduce the risk of exposure, as the CDC states that there's better ventilation outside. However, with the winter season approaching, outdoor seating can be possibly affected for some restaurants. The City of Philadelphia announced a new set of guidelines for outdoor dining during the winter months ahead. They list several options and requirements regarding aspects around shelter, heating, and snow removal management. To learn more, please visit www.phila.gov and click the News and Events tab. Let's see what a few Philly restaurants are doing to prepare for the weather change and the rise in cases. Nacho Flores is the owner of Taquitos de Puebla III located on 9th and Federal Street. He shares his worries and concerns for effects on his business. We had just started business in January. We worked in January and February, but in March, we closed everything due to the pandemic. It was very, very, very difficult. It was very difficult because there wasn't anyone. We had to lay off our employees. We did not have money for the applications. For example, outdoor dining is safe, but it is very expensive, right? But we would have to put in a lot of money for it. We didn't do it because no one was coming. And so, in cold weather, nobody wants to eat out. Therefore, we had no reason to set it up if we're having the same business model. We would be paying more insurance for something that wasn't going to even happen. I think that right now, we sense that in the winter, it is always empty. So we are waiting to see in what way we do not work. There are limitations, especially because people won't be going outside. Flores isn't the only one who's facing problems for the upcoming weather change. Fergie Carey is one of the owners of Fergie's Pub, located on Sansom Street between 12th and 13th Street. 2019 was our busiest year ever. Mm -hmm. It was after 25 years, it was the busiest year ever. And, uh, you know, we had new projects going on, uh, you know, beginning in the end of December and then in January. And then, like, you know, sh like the before 
before the shutdown, we decided to shut down ourselves. Like the, the Monday, the uh, 16th, the, um, the states shut us down, but we had already closed on Sunday the 15th. We thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and then, uh, but like, and in that last week too, business just took a dive. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like a, it was bad. And then, um, anyway, so then we had closed for three months and then opened for it to go and stuff for a few months. And then like, then we went out on the street and that saved us for a bit. But uh, last this uh, last week, uh, Thursday of last week, things were so bad and looking so bleak, with the uh, the weather getting colder and then the. Uh, uh, our business then cut in half again, mm -hmm. and I was like, so, and then I was like, I was looking at things, and I was like, well, we're not going to survive, we're going to have to do something for, uh, and then uh, we did a GoFundMe to save Fergie's Pub, mm -hmm. and uh, we have been, uh, you know, we, we're, we're involved all the time, we're involved with the th theatre and music, and uh, the, uh, and we, but everybody came back. It was beautiful. We tried. We wanted to raise thirty thousand dollars, which we thought was the bare minimum. We raised that in eighteen hours, and then we extended up to sixty, and we've since hit that. We're over around sixty-three thousand right now. I'm a little. I'm not looking at it as much now because I'm uh, distracted by this election. The yeah. So now we're uh, in a position to survive a few wintry months because that's where we we just you know the people are not comfortable coming inside for the most part yeah. still we are allowed 50 percent capacity but we haven't opened up stairs yet because people are not coming in like yeah. you know, they're not and, and then like even when it's cold out people want to sit outside so mm -hmm. having to play the heater game outside yeah. and yeah. stuff like that um, how do i think uh pandemic and winter is going to affect my employees mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to make them poor. Uh, this is uh, what we're expecting. You know, people are not comfortable, and a lot of people are not comfortable coming inside yet. And uh, but then, I mean, everybody's building shelters outside their restaurants and bars. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, I haven't really gone that far yet. But I, well, just I have limitations outside. I can only do so much. But it's uh, yeah. I also I, I don't want to basically step side and I don't want especially if I'm if I'm having a nice meal I'm not I don't want to spend money and then sit on Broad Street outside Capitol Grill I want to be inside there are many worries that many restaurant owners are facing who knows what harsh conditions may come this winter season for Philly Cam Voices this is Shivani Reddy Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are declared the winners of the 2020 presidential election. Pennsylvania pushed them over the top with 273 electoral votes to win. This weekend, they accepted their positions as president-elect and vice president-elect in Wilmington, Delaware. But President Trump has not conceded and vows to fight the results. For more on the election, I have two guests. Joining me now is Voices reporter and WPPM radio host, Dennis Link. Also joining me is Vincent Thompson. He is the owner of the public relations firm, Thompson Media Man Communications. He has also been a longtime political observer and reporter in Philadelphia. Welcome, fellas. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for having us on. So let's get started. We know that this has been the buzz. We waited patiently for days to get a response. So first, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are declared the winners, but they are still counting votes. Can you kind of just explain for the viewers, what does that mean? I'll start. Well, um, basically, mm -hmm. Basically, the big thing about this election that's unusual is most people are used to an election where you vote at a machine and a city can quickly get the results back. And remember, these are still unofficial results. Most uh, states do not uh, officially categorize their results or claim them until about 15 to 20 days after the actual election. The thing that has made this election harder than most is because of COVID, and because many states started mail-in ballots for the first time, you are actually counting mail-in ballots. And just imagine 
how long it takes you when you're at home looking through your mail. You have to open up the envelope. You got to open up the thing, read it. That's the same thing that's happening across the country. So, you know, you mail in a ballot, you have to open up the ballot, you have to flatten the paper ballot. You got to make sure you can see it to make sure there's no mistakes or a part's not ripped. And then you have to put it through the machine to actually count the ballot. That's time consuming work. And in a lot of states, they're not allowed to start counting the ballots until the morning of election day. So in Pennsylvania, for example, we have 12 million people who live in a state and let's say 5 million people actually voted, millions by mail, millions in the polling place. It takes a lot to count those ballots. So that's why it's taking so long. So there's no nefarious issues. There's no hidden agendas. It just takes a long time to open up mail ballots and count them. All right, Denny. Yeah, and Amanda. In, yeah, ju in so just to give you, yeah, I was just going to say that um, where things stand now, and, and this information might be um, a, a little bit dated, uh, just in the sense that uh, I, I pulled most of it last night. But as of last night, there was 80,000 mail-in votes still to count. And um, there was still an additional 105,000 provisional ballots uh, to be counted. And, and just to let people know what those are, those are given to people who show up at the polls. And if there's a question about their eligibility to vote, um, you know, and they can't resolve it there, they allow the person to vote and record their choices and, and then um, resolve it later. So we still have a bunch of those. And as I understand it, I believe there are still some military overseas ballots that came in that they still have to count. So um, we, you know, as of, you know, yet last night we were talking about still 190,000 ballots left, which is 98.4% of, of the statewide, uh, you know, count, you know, so we're pretty close to the end, but uh, yeah, we still have, you know, some counting that they, they, they have left to do. Wow, that is a lot of counting that has to continue. Now, Dennis, in your opinion, what does Biden declaring victory mean for the country and for our region? Well, I think uh, for the country, it doesn't mean that much in the sense that although Joe Biden is the declared winner and it surely looks like he will be inaugurated as president of the United States in January. The Democrats did not do well nationwide in other respects. So uh, if, for instance, if you take a look at the, uh, the House of Representatives and um, that has 435 members and the count going into election day, I believe was the Democrats having an advantage of 232 seats to the GOP uh, was 197. And I believe there were some vacant seats in there as well. So um, the GOP needed a net gain of plus 21 to get to the 218 that you need for majority. And it looked like a tall order. It didn't look like they had any chance. And as a matter of fact, many experts were believing that Joe Biden was going to wipe out uh, Donald Trump nationwide. And that was also going to mean that uh, the re Republicans were going to lose even more seats in the House. But as it stands now, they've actually gained seats in the House. So right now they're at 200. And in the 10 remaining competitive races that are still too close to call in terms of the House, the GOP is leading in nine of them. So we don't think that they'll necessarily win you know, all nine of those seats, but we're looking at they're at 200 now. And they could you know, maybe you know, get up to you know, 207, 208. And again, it's not enough for them to take control of the House, but it is enough for uh, the, the, the GOP to make it a little bit harder for Democrats to pass legislation, because if you can just peel away a few Democrats, um, you know, you're in a situation where, uh, you know, the, the, the Democratic controlled House can't necessarily ram every piece of legislation through. And then as far as the Senate, again, a lot of people were thinking that the re Republicans would lose all the contested races. So there were nine competitive races, but the GOP held in five of them. So, um, you know, there's still some races to be called. And, um, you know, there's going to be two runoff races in Georgia, which are going to be key. So if the, um, you know, if the Democrats win both of those, they will have a majority. 
if they only win one of those, it'll be tied 50 50. And but the advantage will still be to uh, you know the Democrats because Kamala Harris would become the deciding vote in Senate uh, you know votes, and and if the Democrats lose both of the Georgia runoff races, the Republicans will still be in control of the Senate. So the fact that nationwide things didn't go as well for Democrats as they did for Joe Biden means that as far as the country, I I don't know that you know we we're going to have a mandate for Joe Biden. Um, and I don't know that it's going to be easy to get past the gridlock because the Republicans will still have considerable control, you know, gaining some in the House and possibly maintaining it in the Senate. Mm. That is sure, a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah, I think in a yeah. nutshell, when you look at what's going on, basically, I always tell people you have to look past the numbers. And one of the great things about the state of Pennsylvania is Philadelphians look at Philly but we only look at Philly, right? And that's a bad thing. The rest of the state went red. So most, a lot of people in Pennsylvania and counties outside of Philadelphia and the four suburban counties, Allegheny County where Pittsburgh is and uh, Harrisburg is, they voted red. So they supported Donald Trump. And that is a lot of what the country still has. Even though Joe Biden is gonna go down in history as having the most votes of any presidential candidate, with 75 million plus, Donald Trump is gonna come in second in this election with over 72 million. So there's a lot of divided parts of this country. We are definitely not the United States of America. We are, there's red parts of America and blue parts of America. And that's the difficulty in binding this together because, you know, like Dennis said, you can have a democratic president and you can have a Democratic U.S. House of Representatives for the most part. And if, if you had told Republican operatives that they would have over 200 members when the night was over, they would have thought you were crazy. And now that they could possibly have 205, 206, they're a stat. And you're going to have a Republican, you're most likely either going to have maybe a Republican-led U.S. Senate or you're going to have a 50-50 U.S. Senate. So that means there's a lot of gridlock that's going to happen. So I... I tell people all the time, you might have a new president because a lot of people didn't like Donald Trump, but don't think that Trumpism isn't going to last in America. His form of populism and intense, that's going to last for decades to come, and he's going to be an overwhelming force in the Republican Party. I would not be surprised if four years from now, whomever Donald Trump endorses for president becomes the leading candidate for the Republican nomination. Yeah, and, and Amanda, another factor was that the, um, yeah, so another factor was uh, a lot of Democrats were excited about the possibility of taking the state house, of flipping that from, from Republican to Democrat. And there were a lot of races that, that Republicans had to try to defend statewide. And, and so what's important about that is if the, the house is in Democratic control and, and if, you know, they were also trying to get the Senate. That can help in terms of funding that comes towards Philadelphia, and that can help in terms of Philadelphia having more independence on things such as, you know, having their own gun control laws, you know, which right now they can't, you know, the state has to, you know, uh, approve those things, um, you know, so that was why that was really important, but that didn't go the, D the Democrats way at all either. So it not only did, uh, you know, the, the, the Republicans retain control of the state house but it looks to me now that the Democrats may actually lose a couple of incumbents. And, um, you, you know, and then I think the, the Republicans gained one state Senate seat. So uh, as, in terms of, you know, in Pennsylvania, uh, things got no easier for Democrats. I mean, you know, there is a Democratic governor, but in terms of the, uh, you know, the legislature, that really didn't change at all. And, and like Vincent was saying, you know, we're going to have gridlock. At, at a national level, you know, as it appears right now. And we're probably gonna have continued gridlock here in Pennsylvania because of the fact that, you know, um, it, it just, there were a lot of red counties, like Vincent said, that, that stayed red and that helped those local people. And it also, um, you know, in terms of the three statewide races, it looks like Josh Shapiro is going to win reelection as attorney general. In fact, I believe he's been called. 
But the Republicans, it appears, have won the Auditor General race, which is a statewide race. And right now, Joe Torcella, the incumbent Democrat, looks like he, uh, right. you know, is on the outside looking in and might lose that race for treasurer. So um, the, the, what the Republicans tried to do was focus on the, the, the southwest and the west part of Pennsylvania, because that's trending a little more red. So they figured, OK, we'll put all of our resources there and try to win in that area as as you know, the southeast part of the country. I'm sorry, the, the, the part of the state is going bluer and bluer with Philadelphia and those ring counties. All right. All right, Vincent. Pennsylvania was key to Joe Biden being declared the winner. How important was the voting in Philadelphia and the suburbs? And how important was that black vote? Oh, always in Philadelphia. I mean, African-American voters are key in the Democratic Party, not just in Philadelphia, but African-American voters are key to the Democratic Party nationwide. So if you go to cities like Detroit, New York, um, uh, uh, um, Minneapolis, uh, you also go to places like uh, Milwaukee. The black folks critical. The black vote and black folks are critical in the Democratic Party. But a winning strategy in Pennsylvania is you got to do well in Philadelphia, right? You have to do well in Philadelphia. You've got to do well in the collar counties, Bucks, Chester, Montgomery, and Delaware. Remember, Donald Trump did very well in Bucks County. So that's an important thing to see. You do well up in Lehigh, uh, Lehigh Valley the Lehigh counties, those kind of areas, you do well in the center part of the state and you do well in Allegheny County. And th those large population centers kind of offset the red parts of the state, the middle parts of the state, that kind of thing. The thing that helped Joe Biden this year was he did well in the parts of the state that he had to, and he did better than Hillary Clinton in the red county. So a good example, let's say Donald Trump one Clarion County, I'm just coming up with a number. Um, there are 15,000 voters, he got 10,000, right? Hillary Clinton four years ago might've gotten 2,000, but, but because Joe Biden got 5,000, those kind of incremental numbers across the state of Pennsylvania help out a huge, huge in Pennsylvania. So it kind of, so it's critically important, but like I tell people, you look at a map of Pennsylvania, look at the individual counties, and we're still a mostly Republican state. And take away the counties of Philadelphia, the suburbs, and you take away um, Pennsylvania, you take away uh, Pittsburgh, as, John, as, as, a, as a political expert once called it, there's Philadelphia and Pittsburgh with Alabama in the middle. We're still very red, very Alabama, very conservative. And that's something that's gonna have to last past this presidency and throughout. You cannot underestimate that red in the center part of the state and the thinking of the center part of the state is it impacts the state house, the state senate, and it impacts the governor. I always tell people, if you live in Philadelphia, go outside of Philadelphia to learn Pennsylvania. Okay. Now, yeah, and, our and time is almost up. So I'm gonna ask one quick question from each of you. Um, Vincent. Does Trump really have a leg to stand on with these lawsuits? And Dennis, um, do you think mm -hmm. there'll be a smooth transition? So you first, Vincent, and then we'll wrap the show up. Uh, to both questions, the answer is no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, as far as uh, the, you know, the legal action, I think the Trump campaign's best strategy is related to the, you know, the the, um, the late votes that came in. Uh, does the state law okay. and the state have to, you know, prescribe what the election rules are? The legislature does that. Um, okay. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania is the ones that okay. extended that, that three-day period, and um, so I'm thinking that they could be successful if they get to the U.S. Supreme Court in trying okay, to get those late ones thrown out. But but right, yeah, as far as a food transition of power, I think it's going to be kind of bumpy. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for tuning in to Philly Cam Voices.